This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Imagine this. You're a passenger on a flight flying home following a vacation. All seems well until an explosion on board shatters the atmosphere of the plane mid-flight. Smoke enters the cabin and a potentially fatal situation has suddenly unfolded. On the flight deck, the pilots lose instruments and are faced with numerous alerts as they try to figure out what the hell happened here. In a rapid descent, they make a quick turn to a nearby airport. This is the harrowing scenario of one such flight in 1985. However, we also want to understand why this happened, and how this incident was connected to a wider issue that existed at the time. Fasten your seatbelt. This is the harrowing story of Monarch Airlines Flight 390. January 14, 1985. Monarch Airlines Flight 390 is cruising high over the Atlantic Ocean. The plane has just taken off from Tenerife in the Canary Islands and is heading home to the United Kingdom, destination Luton. The flight is taking British tourists home, who have enjoyed the sunny weather that keeps holidaymakers coming back to Tenerife. The aircraft is a brand new Boeing 757. In 1985, this is the most technologically advanced plane to ever take to the skies, boasting many new sophisticated computer systems. For example, taking a leap forward in cockpit displays, the 757 features what is known as a glass cockpit, meaning that some of the more traditional analog gauges have been replaced with electronic digital screens that more clearly convey information to pilots. Keeping with the theme of electronics, the plane has an advanced flight management computer, and the developments made by the 757 effectively made the third position flight engineer's role obsolete. Though now out of production, many 757s still fly today and is a well-loved aircraft among pilots, passengers, and especially aviation enthusiasts. Monarch introduced this plane into their fleet in 1983, and was actually amongst the first air carriers to get a hold of the new 757. This specific aircraft, Golf Mike Oscar November Delta, was only the 19th 757 to roll off the production line. It was being flown by two of Monarch's most experienced pilots. According to a former pilot of the airline, Monarch would have transferred only their best from their Boeing 720s and BAC 111s onto the brand new 757. Unfortunately, we don't know much else about the flight crew, but we know that they would have been highly experienced. To be honest, the case of Monarch 390 received extraordinarily little coverage when it occurred. Despite this, the Monarch incident was connected to a wider issue within aviation at the time for reasons we'll get into soon. It was one of the earlier major incidents of this particular problem. Through analyzing a multitude of reports across different mediums and from aggregating that together, we can build an image of what happened here. And what happened here was very interesting indeed. After leaving Tenerife on January 14, 1985, Monarch 390 was getting off to an uneventful start. This would quickly change, but it's here we must go inside of the plane's guts, so to speak. For you see, over time, the state of some of the aircraft's electrical wiring had deteriorated rather quickly. If you were to lay out all of the wiring inside a plane like the 757, it would stretch for miles and miles and miles. Much of that wiring is bundled together in sort of wire corridors that run throughout the plane out of sight to passengers and crew members, often running underneath the passenger cabin. In order to shine a light on the problem that would soon manifest in catastrophic failure, we really need to know more about the wiring on this aircraft, and a good place to start would be to briefly talk about and establish a basic understanding of the structural makeup of electrical cables. It would all be well and good for me to give a surface level description and say that a thing happened with these wires, but as they say, the devil is in the details, and we need to look inside of the wires themselves. 
To keep it simple, the composition of the electrical cable consists of a conductor material that carries an electrical current. Copper is a typical conductor and was used in this case. Numerous copper threads are then wrapped in a shielding and insulating material. And it's this insulating material that is where this devil lies. What could be so threatening about insulating material, you may ask? Well, we need to be more specific about what it is we're talking about here. The material used as an insulator in this case falls under a family of materials known as a polyimid. It's a material that was first discovered in the 20th century. It had been observed that this polymer had some interesting heat and flame resistance properties. Beginning in the 1960s, a polyimid material manufactured by the DuPont Corporation became the first widespread use of polyimid, and though its use extends to a wide variety of applications, we are primarily focused on its use as an insulator for aircraft electrical wiring. DuPont branded their make of polyimid under the name of Kapton. If you believe its hype, Kapton on the surface seems like a miracle material. You can typically find it in the form of a tape or film and features this distinctive amber color. Kapton has a wide range of benefits. It can withstand extreme radiation and temperature conditions, ranging from near absolute zero up to 400 degrees Celsius. In fact, given this benefit, Kapton is the perfect material for use in space vehicles and satellites, and it's been used by NASA for decades. In addition to that, it's also flexible, lightweight, thin, can bond with a multitude of surfaces, be molded for a seemingly endless number of applications, and above all else, it was observed to be very strong. Its benefits have made Kapton a useful material that is still widely used today, and obviously for good reasons. Since its invention in the 1960s, aircraft manufacturers raced to put Kapton insulated wiring into their planes. Kapton outclassed other insulators. Its weight-saving benefit in particular was a huge pull. It might not sound like much, we're talking about the weight of wire insulation, but miles and miles of the stuff across a whole plane? It adds up. Captain had set a very high standard for wire insulation. Boeing, Airbus, McDonnell Douglas, especially McDonnell Douglas, they all installed this Captain polyimid wiring. However, despite its benefits, Captain is actually not a miracle material. For you see, for all of its good, if the conditions are right, Kapton can also be deadly. And when Kapton goes wrong, it looks like this. But is this material really as dangerous as it looks? Airliners of the 1980s, such as the Airbus A310, Boeing 757, McDonnell Douglas MD-11, and many, many more, a lot of these planes were being fitted with Kapton wiring. For years, it was deemed to be a good insulator with good performance. And though we've touched upon some of the benefits of the material, we should really go into more detail and establish why many in the industry really soured against it. The drawbacks and danger of polyimid Kapton in this context really stem from one problem with the material, in that it is susceptible to decay. The rate of which polyimid degrades over time was something that had not really been anticipated when it was first introduced. The level of testing needed to discover its shortcomings were not fully developed at the time. Wire degradation has been well studied in the years since, and as it turns out, the degradation of Kapton polyimid is exacerbated through increased heat and moisture exposure. Not only that, it is also susceptible to worse damage during handling, installation, and maintenance scenarios. The Federal Aviation Administration later published a report in the 2000s that concluded, seeming to confirm that wires made from Kapton polyimid, among other polymers, will age faster under these conditions, therefore further inducing the breakdown of this wire's insulation. When coupled with the constant vibrations and turbulence of flight, the quality of this wiring could really become a problem. Of course, wear and tear can be an issue for any material, but Kapton decay, in particular, had a tendency to take effect rather quickly, especially as a thin tape or film. Case in point, we're talking about an incident involving what was a rather new plane. If this wire insulation is then broken down, leaving the conductor inside exposed, 
this could, if given the right conditions, be a candidate environment for electrical arcing to occur. And that is exactly what this is. Electrical arcing events can be extremely hot, to the point of burning the Kapton insulator, inducing a chemical transformation that produces a conductive path, resulting in arc tracking. Now you've got a fire. There are videos right here on YouTube where you can watch how arcing on Kapton wire can propagate. The heat from arcing can be intense. We're talking into the thousands of degrees, melting the conductor metal inside, leaving behind re-solidified copper balls on the wire. And if, say, molten fragments from an arcing event meet flammable materials, then that can be cause for an absolutely devastating in-flight fire. This is an issue if you are fitting wires into an airplane, sealing them behind panels and then forgetting about them. All of this is important to know to understand what happened on our incident flight. Which brings us back to Monarch Flight 390. Though this was a relatively new aircraft, some of its Kapton polyimid wire insulation had suffered significant decay. The catastrophic failure that occurred here all took place in one general area in the front of the plane. In the nose of the aircraft, we obviously have the flight deck. Immediately after here, on the outside of the cockpit door, is the galley and the forward lavatory, before then reaching first class and the rest of the main deck. Located underneath here, on the lower deck, however, it's here we have the electronics and equipment bay. Certainly not unique to the 757, many planes have compartments like these. This is where many of the aircraft's computers and electrical systems are stored. As you then might expect, a lot of electrical wiring runs in and out of this compartment, and the area of interest in this case is located about here, a space between wires belonging to the left main generator systems and the P70 distribution panel, which you can see here. It just so happens that the critical point of crisis was located directly underneath the drain of the forward lavatory. Investigators later found evidence of this decayed Kapton wiring in this area. What had happened was, at some point, identifying markings on the wires were made, and when that was done, it had damaged the insulation in a way that it enabled significant decay, exposing the conductor. But there's more to it than that. Reportedly, when investigators later looked inside the space, they found that the area had, to use wording from one report on the matter, become saturated with liquid. The revelation here being that toilet fluids had leaked from the drainage of the lavatory, coming in contact with nearby bundles of electrical wiring. The liquid in question was a cleaning solvent that is simply just poured down the drain. Could have been done by a flight attendant during the turnaround in Tenerife for all we know. A combination of decay mounting in the form of initial damage to the wire, stresses of flight and cleaning solvent, what this ultimately meant was leaking fluid locally dripping onto this mass of wires which had decayed, exposing the conductor inside. This resulted in what is known as a wet arcing event. In that instant, Monarch Airlines Flight 390 went from a routine flight to a fight for survival. As reports go, two distinct explosions were heard in the cabin and cockpit, as arcing in the electronics bay began to take effect, damaging numerous systems on the plane the captain's side digital display screens go blank. The arcing had damaged the wiring related to the systems powered by the left generator, tripping it offline. In fact, according to a former Boeing electrical engineer who wrote about the incident, the arcing had completely severed some of the wiring here. As a result, the captain's primary instruments ceased to function. From the onset of the crisis, several audible warnings sound in the cockpit, it would have been a very overwhelming situation for the pilots. In the cabin, those sitting towards the front see smoke. It's almost as if out of sight there is a fire somewhere on board. The pilots try to restart the left generator by reconnecting the relevant breakers and supplying power from the right. An electrical current had been resumed through the faulting wiring, causing more arcing. This increased the amount of noxious smoke filling the cabin. Additionally, as a consequence, the right generator then also tripped offline. Both pilots' display screens were now blank. They had to defer to their standby instruments. The situation continues to deteriorate as the pilots have noticed something else. The cabin altitude is rising, meaning pressure inside the fuselage has dropped. 
Without the generators, the cabin pressurization system cannot be powered. Therefore, the cabin altitude begins to rise. They react by initiating an emergency descent, grabbing their oxygen supplies, and issuing a distress call. The pilots need to get their plane on the ground as soon as possible. Luckily, the plane had been in the air for about an hour before the emergency began. Heading north towards the United Kingdom, this meant several airports the pilots would have been familiar with in being monarch destinations were within reach. They elect to land at the nearest airport in Lisbon, Portugal. Running through the checklists and procedures, the pilots try to reset the right generator in an effort to restore some electrical power to the plane. Though the right generator could actually be brought back online, the left remained off. The fact that they now had one generator running, the pilots were able to neutralize the changing cabin altitude. They continue with their descent and prepare for an emergency landing in Lisbon. In the cabin, the flight attendants were able to contain the fire and smoke, with the senior flight attendant entering the cockpit to update the pilots on the cabin situation. As Flight 390 was preparing for landing, that's when another problem reared itself. As part of normal landing procedure, the flaps need to be extended. Now, when the crisis first began, amongst the barrage of warnings the pilots received, these included warnings pertaining to the leading edge and trailing edge flaps. However, it was unclear how the in-flight explosions may have affected the flap system. When they reached for the flap lever, there was no response from the flap position indicator. It didn't move. In this specific instance, the pilots saw it was best to execute a flapless landing, of which the pilots would have been trained for. As it would turn out, there would also be no spoiler deployment on landing either. The flaps are supposed to help with landing, as changing the characteristics of the wing in this way with a higher flap setting, this creates a lot of drag, enabling pilots to extract more lift from the wings at a lower speed. It's rare to not use the flaps, but if an emergency calls for it, it needs to be done. Pilots are trained to perform flapless landings right from the beginning in flying school, but there is quite the difference in performing this between a Cessna and a Boeing 757, but it can be done. Without the flaps, a higher speed needs to be maintained and the pilots must navigate the landing at a shallower angle and expand the excess speed in the moments before the wheels touch the ground. Thankfully, the runway in Lisbon is very long and was ideal for this type of landing. The crew of Flight 390 pull it off, and the stricken 757 touches down in Lisbon. Though it had been reported that the ground spoilers weren't deployed, the plane came to a stop safely. There were no reported fatalities or injuries. It's a remarkable case of pilots retaining authority over their plane in an emergency. It has been said that this incident could have ended in disaster. However, this was not the end of the Capitan story. There certainly was already a developing conversation about this material in the aviation industry, and with the finding that the Capitan wire had arced, some areas of the aviation world were taking notice, as these issues were becoming known. For example, in the late 1980s, military operators noticed this problem following several incidents of their own, and promptly banned Capitan from their planes. It resulted in numerous airframes being scrapped as a result. But incidents in commercial aviation still occurred. I would like to direct your attention to one of the more known pieces of reporting on Capitan in the media. A 1999 BBC panorama documentary titled Die by Wire. Oh, that's clever. This is a piece of Captain insulated wire. It's still made to this day and flies in over a third of the world's commercial planes. Captain is best when young, it's featherweight, the thickness of only about three human hairs, flame resistant, tough. That was the good news. One of the main points in this piece is that wiring-related incidents weren't always being labeled as such. An example that was given in this documentary was an autopilot failure. That would be logged as just that, an autopilot failure and not necessarily a failure with the wiring. On a more zoomed out level, this may have had the effect of other polyimid related incidents going under the radar. So what were some of those other incidents being lumped into this discussion. Philippine Airlines Flight 143, May 11th, 1990. Fuel tank explosion. This incident was fatal, killed eight people. Damaged wiring is believed to have been the culprit. Fuel vapors in the center fuel tank were ignited from an arcing event. Wiring had reportedly not been fitted correctly. 
the NTSB refers in their safety recommendations to specifically check wire insulation. The FAA did not follow through on the NTSB's recommendations. However, Boeing would go on to remove Kapton insulation from their production in the early 90s. If the circumstances around this incident sound at all familiar to you, that's because a remarkably similar occurrence brought down a Boeing 747 out of New York in 1996. Scandinavian Airlines Flight 666, Copenhagen, November 24, 1993. This was another case of electrical failure. A McDonnell Douglas MD-80 aircraft experienced a fire on the ground, with investigators later finding evidence of arcing, with an emphasis on wire degradation from chafing. McDonnell Douglas, like other companies, installed Kapton wiring into their planes. In fact, McDonnell Douglas in 1976 had been informed by their then-current wiring supplier that production of their wires used on their DC-10s were being discontinued. This meant McDoubled D had to find a new wire for their plane, and one of the wires they had selected for general use was a Kapton polyimid insulated wire. They began installing that onto their DC-10s and eventually their MD-11s, and one of those MD-11s suffered a severe polyimid-related event. The disaster of Swiss Air Flight 111 on September 2nd, 1998, claimed the lives of 229 people. The incident, a devastating in-flight fire as a result of an arcing event, believed to have come from wiring powering the in-flight entertainment system, that fire spread, destroying many of the aircraft systems, ultimately leaving the plane uncontrollable. Though the pilots valiantly tried to the end to save their plane, Swiss Air 111 plunged into the Atlantic Ocean, killing everyone on board. Investigators there had been able to find, after an exhaustive effort in recovering miles and miles of the aircraft's wiring, that an arcing event was likely the culprit. For evidence of this, they found those telltale signs of arcing. They found those re-solidified copper balls where the conductor had melted, implicating decay of the wire's insulation. The arcing event that occurred on Swiss Air 111 does differ somewhat from the Monarch incident. It's not exactly an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. Swiss Air was a case of dry arcing. The insulation had become worn down from the stresses of flight, as opposed to any sort of conflict with liquid. And the arcing, on its own, is not really what brought down the Swiss Air plane. What really propagated the Swiss Air fire wasn't really the Capiton itself, but rather the metallized polyethylene terephthylate mylar film that blanketed the wiring. It's known as MPET for short. Though the FAA had previously approved MPET for use as an insulation blanket on aircraft, the Swiss Air investigation concluded in their report that certification standards for material flammability were inadequate, and MPET is actually highly flammable. Once the arcing set these insulation blankets ablaze, the pilots of the Swiss airplane were left fighting for survival against an uncontrollable inferno. It was a fight they ultimately lost. I do have to wonder, if the circumstances were a little different, would the Monarch incident have ended differently? Lessons learned from Swiss Air really highlighted the importance of fire safety. Evaluations of potentially flammable materials were made in the aftermath, and action was taken. And to be honest, polyimid-related incidents have been rare since the mid-1990s. As for the Captain material itself, it is still sort of in use to this day though there has been an emphasis on phasing out the material, and the discussion around this has been ongoing for years. However, in its current form, key changes have been made to the standard polyimid wire. Other materials, like Teflon, have been introduced to strengthen and improve the reliability and integrity of these wires. Adding Teflon to polyimid retains its benefits whilst building on what was already there. As we learned more about this material, engineers and manufacturers learned to adapt and work with it in the realm of its limitations. Testing procedures have been developed to suss out the vulnerabilities of these types of wires. Though it has its own history, if it is properly taken care of, polyimid Kapton is not considered a threat to aviation safety today. Of course, this doesn't mean the use of Kapton has gone unchecked. Some have just stopped using it altogether. Kapton has still divided opinion among the experts, some trust it more than others. Overall though, it's worth remembering that modern airliners rely more on computerized systems today than they did in the past. 
and with that has come an emphasis on the safety of the electronics it houses. Given all of the improvements in recent decades, experts have considered the use of these wires to be reasonable, pending the discovery of a newer, better material. Now, if you enjoy these sorts of videos, you might have an interest in airplanes and how they work, the technical side, the engineering side. Well, that's where this video sponsor comes in, Brilliant. Brilliant brings you the courses you need to get learning more about subjects related to maths, data analysis, computer science, programming, engineering, and more. Brilliant is where you learn by doing. They feature thousands of interactive, hands-on classes crafted by an award-winning team of teachers, making Brilliant the most effective way to learn. It helps you build problem-solving and critical thinking skills, allowing you to build real knowledge not just from memorizing. For example, Brilliant recently launched a ton of new content in data using real-world datasets to train you to see trends and make better informed decisions, perfect for learners of any level. Check out their Predicting with Probability course, which lets you work with real air traffic data. To help you grow as a learner, Brilliant encourages you to learn a little every day so you develop a new, positive, and powerful daily learning habit. This is one of the most important things you can do, both for professional and personal growth. With lots of fun lessons you can do whenever you have the time, it's way better than the alternative of mindlessly scrolling. Try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days. Visit brilliant.org slash disaster breakdown or click the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. So that's brilliant.org slash disaster breakdown and start learning today. Tell them Chloe sent you. A big thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Hello everyone, thank you so much for watching this video. I'm a YouTuber so I've got to ask you to hit that like button and smash the subscribe button while you're at it. This was a short one, for once. I forgot what this was like. Remember when 20 minute disaster breakdown episodes were considered long? It almost feels strange now looking down at my timeline and only seeing 26 minutes, but that is how this one panned out. Anyway, I would like to give a quick thanks to one of the sources used in the making of this video. I mentioned it briefly earlier in the video itself. A former Boeing electrical engineer by the name of Carl Tenning wrote about the Monarch incident. He had a bunch of electrical essays on his site and the Monarch case happened to be the subject of one of them. He went into more of the technical aspects of the accident and seriously, this video wouldn't have been the same without his writings. So I really have to make the acknowledgement and thank Carl for his contribution in the conversation around this very obscure case. You can find his work in the top of the references document attached to this video and you'll find that in the description below. A number of people have actually asked what those numbers are that come up throughout the videos now. It's basically a referencing system, so viewers can easily check what is said in the videos. It's so you can check and learn more if you want. I started doing it last year, and it's only made me wish I'd done it sooner, to be honest. Anyway, I must take a moment to thank my amazing patrons over on Patreon for their incredible support to the channel. Their names are scrolling on the screen right now, so if you see your name here, a big thanks to you. We have a whole bunch of shoutouts to get through today, once again, so here we go. We begin with business class patrons in order of which they joined. A thank you to Laurie Gross, Bessie Matthews, and Scott Parsons. Thank you all so much. And of course, a big thank you to my first class patrons. Shout out to Disco, Jake Merton, Many Curls, Chris Stuxinski, I hope I said that right, and Mike Chance. What a bunch of legends. Thank you all so much. If you yourself would like to support the channel further, you can join the Disaster Breakdown Patreon from just £1 per month, and the link to that will be in the pinned comment below. All patrons get early access to all new videos two days before they go out publicly. Right, I must wrap this up because I have to plan and pack for the next video. I shall see you soon. Goodbye!